morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I'm so used to my elementary school kids who go, good morning, Mr. Head. Yeah, that's it. You know. Well, so, so thankful. You don't have to do that. That's not an expectation that I'm placing on you. I'm just habit. I, I had to ask a second time because I wasn't hearing the little, little voices. So thankful to be together today. Hey, I'm really glad that I have my friend Megan here with us worshiping uh, this morning. We have several people again this week out of our worship team. So we've made some adjustments. If you see in your bulletin, uh, some of that is incorrect. But never fear. God is still here. I didn't mean to rhyme that. That sounds a little cheesy. Uh, we're off to a great start. My friends, would you stand with me as we begin our service in God's word? We know that we can't approach God on our own. God himself, in his Holy Spirit, gives us the words. And we are this morning using the words from Psalm 34, which is um, this psalm of, of praise moving from personal to corporate. So let's pray together as we begin our service. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall come into the end. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed.
when, when Christ came at the first, he was unrecognized by all, except for the poor, the shepherds, right? Those who God invited in. When he comes again, he will be recognized by all. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. Um, we're going to read, as we've been doing, uh, from the prophets this morning. And this is from the book of Isaiah. There's this incredible moment where Jesus goes to worship with the people of God in the temple. And he's given the scroll. And he opens up the scroll to Isaiah. And he reads this. And he says, this is what I am here fulfilling by your hearing. So hear these words this morning, knowing that Christ fulfills this for us. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness, instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. And all God's people said,
couple of weeks to our missionaries um, and then if you if you can I mentioned it last week uh, we'll probably mention it for a few more weeks is uh, at the end of the service one of our biggest needs is uh, everybody does a great job stacking the chairs but actually taking the chairs and dollying them out to uh, the, the uh, containers in the back so we've got three of them uh, three um, dollies to use and we need some men who can do it um, and the intention is that we have a group of guys that set up on on Sunday mornings or Saturday nights uh, they do a fantastic job so last week when I made a plea for more helpers uh, we had one new guy and then two of our regulars went and we're doing it and I'm like that's not the point so we really want you guys if you can if you're able to uh, to help with that it doesn't take real long um, nor do you, we want you to every week do it because then you lose out on the fellowship that you could have but, uh, but we really want to do that, to uh, help these guys out. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, thank you. We're glad you're here. Um, there's, a seat, there's a card in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you fill that out, and you can give it to me at the end of the service, or our tithe and offering box there is in the back. Uh, you can put it in there. That would be great. Um, but in the meantime, let's take a few minutes and stand up, and let's say hello uh, to the folks that have gathered to worship this morning.
All right, so you see, you may have your seat, you may take your seat. As we move into hearing God's word, I want to uh, share with you a song that has been extremely moving to me over the whole year, really, of 2020. And it's a setting of Psalm 6. And in Psalm 6, we see King David. We're not exactly sure, at least I'm not aware of um, theologians who have placed this in David's life. But hearing the psalm, hearing his words, we can hear that he is sick in bed, that he thinks he's going to die, that his enemies are laughing at him, that they think that he is, he is done for, that he is going away, and he's crying out to God from his bed. I know that for many people around the world, they are sick in bed, dying. And this is a real human experience. And so the Psalms, one thing the Psalms do is they push us toward actually being honest about how we are doing. And maybe that's not you this morning. Maybe you're not home in bed um, sick. But we all are dealing with the sickness of sin. We cannot do the things that we want to do, as Paul says, right? We do the things we don't want to do. We don't do the things we want to do that we should do. We are not um, the people that we should be a lot of the time. By God's grace, he gives us and he himself and he, he grows us. But this song asks the question, how long, O oh Lord? How long? And there's this turn. You'll hear it in the song where, uh, where David says, depart from me, all you evil ones. The Lord, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my prayer. And so I want to teach you this chorus. It's a very simple refrain. Those are your words. How long? How long? O oh Lord, how long? It comes from verse Six or five. I think it's verse five of Psalm six. So you'll sing that at the beginning, and then I'll sing some of the verses of the psalm as we enter into this story of, um, of our enemies, of sickness, of sin. And then I'll, I'll have you all come back in again a couple times with your refrain, okay? This is how it goes.
Speak, O Lord. Speak as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Begin hearing songs. 
It's pretty amazing if you think about it, the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. Everyone's singing. The angels are singing. Zechariah is singing. Mary is singing. The shepherds, it almost seems like, are shouting through the streets about what they've seen. Uh, all of these people are singing. And these songs are all answering the question, how long? How long? He is here, they say. He is here. The songs in Luke 1 and 2, chapter 1 and, verse, and chapter 2, they point backward and they point forward. We're going to get to that in a bit. But all of this is rooted in, I think, a concept that uh, would be beneficial for us to look at. So it's rooted in this Hebrew word, hesed. Hesed. I actually made a little graphic here. Perfect. Hesed. Uh, that's how you write it in, um, in Hebrew. If my daughters were here, they would be starting to write it down. But if you want to go ahead and write that down, um, any, any children especially, this is a good word to remember about who God is. So this word hesed is translated 169 different ways in six different English translations. Some would say it's an untranslatable word. What do we, what do, we do with it? It's, it's used um, in English uh, kindness, mercy, faithfulness, covenant loyalty, favor, unexpected kindness. It's really, it's undeserved kindness. The ESV uh, often uses the words uh, steadfast love. I said steadfast love. In 1535, the translator, Miles Coverdale in England, actually invented a completely new English word to translate this word. Does anyone know what it was? Loving kindness. Loving kindness. All throughout uh, his coverdale and the King James, of course, um, yeah, loving kindness. But Hesed, it, it's all throughout the Old Testament. But it's very important because it's the way that God describes Himself. So if we look at uh, Exodus 34, where He's speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before Him and proclaimed, "The Lord." A God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in hesed, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping hesed for thousands, thousands of generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sin. So he says it twice there, hesed, steadfast love. I think the beautiful thing about this word hesed is, if you want to put the, the hesed slide back up, yeah, perfect. Um, is that we expect God to be powerful, right? We expect him to be holy. But I don't think anyone was expecting him to be kind. Paul says, of course, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So hesed is hundreds of times throughout the Old Testament in Hebrew, all throughout the Law and the Prophets. Not everyone loves it, though. In Jonah, of course, Jonah, after he runs away, he goes into the sea, the fish swallows him up, and then Nineveh is saved. He grumbles to God. And this is what he says. He says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in chesed, and relenting from disaster. Ugh, you can see the angst in Jonah's voice. I knew you would forgive these evil people. But it's most of all something to sing about. Hesed is all throughout the Psalms. Why? Because our worship is based on the loving kindness of God. Right? It's based on the loving kindness of God. It was in Psalm 6. If you look back, in Psalm 6, verse 4, we just sang. Right? Just sang Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me for the sake of how great I am. Right? No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> for the sake of your steadfast love. For the sake of your said. So we aren't here saying, okay, save me for how good I have done. Save me based on who you are, God. You are a God of said. Remember your mercy when you see me. Okay. So now that you've heard about said, there's a really great book that you need to read um, by uh, the author Michael Card. And he wrote it just a few years ago, and I read it, and it just, it really looks through a bunch of different passages in the Old Testament, looking at this concept, Hesed. Um, so if you, if you type in Hesed Michael Card, uh, I highly recommend that book to you. It'd be a good Christmas present as well. Okay, so we're going to read through uh, this passage in the book of Luke, 
I'm sorry I didn't give you any bullet points or fill in the blanks like Mike always does. Um, use your page wisely though. <laughs> Blank slate for you. We're going to start at, uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 39. We see this normal interaction between two women, but it is not normal. It's supernatural. It's something happening. And when Mary speaks, look for that concept of hesed to show up. Beginning in verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So there's a lot there. As I was writing the sermon, um, I was definitely thinking this would be a great two-part sermon. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to do my best not to get caught up in the weeds, but there's a lot in this passage. So in the first part of the passage, you'll see uh, 39 through 45 really is focusing on Elizabeth and John the Baptist. So let's think about this a moment. This is an ordinary moment. Two women getting together who are pregnant. This is a very normal thing to do. I've, you know, my wife has had five kids now. I've been around a lot of pregnant ladies, and they like to compare notes. How's it going? You know, are they, are you sleeping yet? Are they, all that stuff. But even though it's this ordinary moment, as we see throughout Scripture, God is at work, right? These babies are consecrated to the Lord. They are very special, certainly with Jesus as the Lord himself. We, we see that the unborn John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb. womb. Elizabeth explains in verse 44 that he leaps for joy. John the Baptist is already coming into his identity as the one who proclaims Christ's coming. We shouldn't be surprised that he's leaping for joy in the womb. Remember back to verse 15 of this same chapter, Luke 1, 15. What does it say? This is the angel telling uh, Zechariah, For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Ah, there it is. No surprise. In ancient paintings and icons of, uh, of John the Baptist, he's always recognizable. Because he's always doing the exact same thing. He's always pointing with his finger. Right? He points us to Christ. He's also recognizable because sometimes his head is off on a platter and he's holding his head. It's kind of gruesome. I'm not going to show that one on the screen. <laughs> But that's who his identity from God is. He's the one who points us to Christ. And here he is as an unborn baby, and his joy points us to our joy. He's pointing his mother to who the Lord is. And by the Holy Spirit, he's pointing us to our joy. Elizabeth is the first one to call Jesus her Lord in the Gospels. Do you see that? That's what she says. Um, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? John the Baptist, 
his ministry is pretty effective at this point. He's led someone <laughs> to the Lord, even as an unborn baby. He's leading his mother to confess Jesus as Lord. This is, of course, connected to what Paul says later in the book of Philippians, that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. And so we see the Holy Spirit at work all the time here. And what does the Holy Spirit always do? It always directs us toward Christ. And that's what he's doing with John. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing with Elizabeth. It says here that uh, Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit. And that's the deepest explanation for what's happening. The Holy Spirit is all over this. And then the Holy Spirit continues to work and gives Mary these words. This, uh, this song, the song of praise, is sometimes called the Magnificat. Have you heard that, the Magnificat? Uh, it comes from the Latin uh, Magnificat, which means magnifies, which is basically the first thing that Mary says. My soul magnifies the Lord, she says. What does magnify mean? Sometimes we say it, yeah, enlarge. We think of maybe a magnifying glass, if you want to look at something up close. If we are magnifying the Lord, we are gazing at him. And he is becoming larger and larger in our field of vision. And this leads us not to see ourselves larger and larger, but to see him. And we praise him for that. In fact, maybe it strikes you, the similarity between these words and our call to worship from Psalm 34. In Psalm 34, we said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes it boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And he says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. It's a lot of similarity there. And if you think about Psalm 34, especially verse, um, verse 3 there, let us uh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We've moved from me, right, saying, I will bless the Lord. His praise is in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. To then turning to others and saying, oh, magnify with me. Let us exalt his name together. It's that pattern that personal worship leads to worship in, the, in a community. Personal worship leads us to corporate worship. And of course, that's what Mary has experienced herself. She's a good Hebrew girl. She has benefited from daily personal worship with her family under the law. She has been given the Shema, the Shema Israel. In, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, this is a key verse in the Old Testament. Where Moses is saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, Mary included, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. These words shall be on your heart. They are clearly on Mary's heart. She says, generations shall call me blessed. We are blessed, too, because we've received the good news, right? Is this our natural reaction? Do we share in Mary's joy here? If we don't, it might because, be because we haven't grasped the gospel yet. We haven't totally understood or felt or experienced what it is that God has done for us. Because the truth is, I don't know about you, but I know about me, I often prefer my own wisdom to God's wisdom, my own words to God's words, my own desires to God's desires. I prefer my own reputation to God's honor. In Mary, though, we don't see her looking at herself, celebrating what she's done and what she's going to do. I mean, think about it. If you received a message saying that God was going to, through you, help bring salvation to all people, what would be your response? I'd be on Facebook Live or Instagram saying, hey guys, check this out. I feel really cool right now. Thank you for all the congratulations and everything like that. I might be casually dropping it into conversation, you know, like a humble brag. You know, a couple years ago, back when I heard from the Lord, and da 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 da, da yeah. <laughs> And if Mary had been filled up with a story that she is the center of her life, that's what her song would have been. Her song would have been glorifying herself. But no, she, she speaks of God, my Savior. God, my Savior. And her own humble estate. When we are soaked in Scripture, we don't only see God rightly, but we see ourselves rightly as well. 
The story of Scripture is the story of God loving us despite our humble estate. While we were enemies, Scripture says, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. No. She speaks almost immediately of her humble estate. She is little and small in her own view. God is the one being magnified, not herself. I wonder how often do we confuse the two? How often do we magnify ourselves, our own desires, and minimize what God has said? We who were created in God's image and given the purpose of making him known across creation, how often do we instead put forth our own image, whether on social media or conversation, drawing attention to who we are? When someone asks us for advice, do we immediately say, well, here's what I would do, or do we first consult scripture? As followers of Jesus, we want to make much of God and magnify him. And that's what Mary does. We see the fruit of it from the way her song's language uses language from other places in scripture. This actually blew my mind. I was really, I, I wanted to speak from this passage um, when Mike asked me to preach a few, I guess like a month or so ago. Um, but I really had no idea the depth of biblical uh, just continuity in this song. So we talked about the Psalms, um, where, but where else have we seen some of the images Mary uses? If we're carefully listening to scripture, we will remember in, uh, and I did not remember, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah's prayer. After Hannah uh, takes Samuel to Eli and serve there. This is what she prays. Just listen to the, the similarities here. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to shield and raises up. Mary was saying, he humbles and exalts. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. And Hannah goes on in this prayer, but do you see the similarities? By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Mary is drawing on language which the Holy Spirit had already inspired and used in, another, in the life of another woman of faith. There have been many times in my life, um, both in deep joy and terrible sorrow, where God has given me words, brought words of scripture to my mind. Not things that I memorized in Awanas, or not things that I really worked on, um, but they've just... God has reminded me of them, sometimes through someone else, sometimes through a song. And these words were a gift because it's not something that I can just sit and come up with myself to comfort myself or to express my joy. It only comes from a rooted life in communion with God in his word. I love what Pastor Mike said last week when he was talking about um, what he tells his kids. Do you remember what he said? He said, spend time in God's word and spend time with God's people. That's such good advice. When we spend time in God's word and with God's people, God himself spurs us on in a life of faith. One of the most beautiful things about this church to Sophia, my wife and I, when we first came, and continues to be, um, isn't the singing of you all, isn't the preaching, isn't the beautiful building that we have. Um, all those things are great. I actually really like worshiping here in a gym. I wasn't being sarcastic. But one of the most beautiful things is the way that Mike prays. When he prays, you can hear that scripture is all through his, who he is, right? And that points me to do the same. That points me to go deeper into the word. And it ministers to me because the Holy Spirit is all over those words already. So we need to be using those words of scripture as we pray and as we sing. Um, last year, before COVID hit, <laughs> back in January, I guess it was this year, uh, at Ambleside. So I teach Ambleside um, Elementary and Middle School over there. Uh, music and lead the chapels and things like that. 
and we were going to go through uh, the book of Philippians. And I had different speakers lined up, and we were going through an expositional series, and we got interrupted by COVID in March. So we got like two chapters in, um, and then we did the rest of them online. But at the very beginning, I came to Mike and said, Mike, would you, would you speak a little bit about um, who Paul is and who, where he was when he wrote Philippians and kind of an overview for our first week? And he said, well, you know, Josh, I, I actually have that memorized. Do you want me to just say the book for everybody? <laughs> and I said, yeah, you can do that. Let's do that. And so he came and he just, he just delivered 14, 15 minutes of Paul's letter to the Philippians um, with nothing in front of him saying all of that. Not for himself at all, but the Holy Spirit used that. And do you know that at, right now at our school, the seventh grade is memorizing the book of Philippians as a direct result of what Mike did in our midst, right? That's what, that's what it does. It's spending time in God's word, spending time with God's people. It spurs us on to do more, to do more. So let's continue on in, uh, in Mary's song. I'm going to pick up in verse 48. And 49. Um, I'm using the ESC version. I'm so sorry. I realized last night, wait a minute, I based on everything not in the version that is the official version of our church. I went over, get kicked out. Um, I, I do have the ESC on the screen though, and next time I'll make sure to use the ESC. Okay, so here's what Mary says For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, because for he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. So Mary uses these words and they draw her toward reality that she couldn't have come up with on her own. We talked about knowing which story we are a part of. Mary clearly knows of which story she is a part of. Out of the abundance of her heart, her heart filled with scripture, her words flow into a worship song. Her posture is as a worshiper here. She is absolutely a participant in God's story and she revels in it. You and I are the recipients of the same gospel, the same good news that Mary heard, that God has done great things for her. God has done great things for us as well. Our words should also flow out of a heart filled up with that gospel story. Continuing on in verse 50, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Did you hear it? And his mercy. Now, of course, the gospel of Luke was written in Greek, so this is not the actual word has but Mary, as a Hebrew in reading the scriptures, she thinks in the concepts of the Old Testament. So absolutely, and his mercy is for those who fear him, and his hesed is for those who fear him from generation to generation. That is faithful. It's echoes of God's words in Deuteronomy uh, to show hesed to the thousandth generation, the thousands. And this shows us the unity between the Testaments. Some people today, I don't know if you know this, some people today think of God as two different gods. The God of the Old Testament, who's kind of grumpy and mean, and the God of the New Testament, who's just all about love, right? No, that's not true. <laughs> but it's natural to think that, maybe, because uh, everything in our material world is changing. Everything we see, our hair, the grass, the buildings, every single thing we see is constantly changing. Scripture says all flesh all creation is like the grass. The grass withers and fades away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Elsewhere, scripture says, you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. The heavens are the work of your hand. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. You will throw them away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. God's character remains the same consistently from the beginning to the end. Maybe that's why he's, he calls himself the Alpha and the Omega in Revelation, the beginning and the end. God's character is never changing, and we can trust him. He shows his mercy to those who fear him. Verse 51 and 52. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Okay, this is where we tend to get a little bit nervous, maybe. I don't know about you, but proudness is definitely in my heart. This morning, uh, we are missing several musicians, and when I found that out yesterday, people were sick, and a lot of people were sick out here as well. Um, some of you did not hear at all. The FTC is showing you that. Um, but when I found out that we were missing musicians, I was, I was really frustrated deep in my heart. I didn't say anything about it, um, but there's a part 
part of me was really frustrating, partly because I wanted to impress everyone with our cool arrangements of some songs, right? And if I'm honest, there's part of me that, that is unhealthy that wants people to know how good I am, especially when I'm doing something I love, like leading worship. That is so contrary to what I'm called to do. And my wife has been a really good way uh, that God has used to beat that desire out of me over the last nine years that I've been worship leading. It's not something that I really feel all the time, but sometimes that comes back, and I, I think that, that, is not, that is not why we're here, right? That is absolutely the most important instrument in the room is your voices, right? And if I can just get out of the way and let you sing, then we've done, we've done well. C.S. Lewis says this about pride. He says, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and looking down on people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. So in first glance, this would seem to be bad news that Mary's saying. I better get started on thinking about my humble estate or else God is going to bring me down. And this is where Mary actually points us forward to Christ. Because even if we're looking down, Christ himself comes down. And we see him lowly, humble. This is a really amazing moment. I said that these songs point backwards and they point forwards. This points forwards to the words of Paul. I mentioned it earlier, but let's go there. Philippians 2, beginning of Philippians chapter 2. One of my favorite parts of the whole New Testament Paul is telling people not to be proud, basically. Do not think of yourself. Do not think from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Why? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Try harder, try harder, try harder. Right? He doesn't say that. No, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Look to him. Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as things but emptied himself. Emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the lowly estate, the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, what is the therefore, therefore? Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every name should bow heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Christ is the Lord, the glory of God the Father. Jesus himself is the one who is humble and then exalted. Both halves of this verse are true about Jesus. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down, what does it say, the mighty from their thrones. He who is mighty came down off of his throne traveled to a far country to rescue the ones that he loves. And God has exalted those of humble estate, and God highly exalted him, giving him the name above every name. By doing this, Jesus also shows us how to humble ourselves. He is our example. And we see God exalting those who have been humbled. This is our hope. Our Savior Christ is the ultimate expression of both humility and exaltation. I would love to just camp there forever. Verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. We saw that in the Isaiah reading earlier. We saw that in his prayer as well. And here in the Gospel of Luke, is it any surprise that Mary, in anticipation of Jesus' work, would sing this? The hungry being filled with good things, while the rich go away empty. More than any other gospel account, the gospel of Luke is showing us Jesus concerned with the poor, concerned with those who have very little, concerned with those who have been forgotten. The poor, both spiritually and physically, are often so are, are, are so often the ones who identify with Jesus and accept his message, right? And we see it all over. The sinners and the tax collectors, the desperate, the sick, the hungry, they all flock to Jesus as he ministers in countrysides and in towns. In many ways, the rest of Luke's gospel is just the outpouring of these words spoken by Mary. 
Jesus showing God's favor to the lowly and forgotten. Samaritans were ostracized and despised by Jewish society. Who does Jesus make the hero of his parable? The Good Samaritan. Who would a rabbi never speak to in the street? Women. Absolutely not. Who does Jesus engage with over and over again? Women. Lepers, of course, were the outcasts of the community. Being a leper was worse than having COVID. Some sin in your past, it was thought, brought this terrifying, highly contagious disease upon you. And who does Jesus heal? Lepers. How does he heal them? He touches them, which was the most terrible thing you could do with a leper. Right? Now you are unclean, but instead we see the power flowing to them as he touches them. All of these people are lowly and poor. Jesus comes to them and lifts them up. And yet at the same time, the rich are the ones who don't understand Jesus' message. The ones who should get it, the ones who are in the temple, who are serving, who have been given God's law and his words, they often leave his presence confused or angry or plotting. They leave his presence without saving faith. The hungry are filled with good things, Mary says. The rich are sent away empty. Do we tend to identify ourselves with those who are rich or with those who are hungry? That's part of why we have a regular rhythm in our Christian walk of confessing our sins to God and to one another. To say, look, we are all in the same playing field. We are all empty by ourselves. Jesus can't fill you up until you acknowledge that you are empty without him. That's the humility that God is seeking. And then finally we come to verse 54 and 55. Mary's words again. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. There it is. In remembrance of his mercy, of his asset. Helping Israel not become, not because of who Israel is or what Israel has done, but because of who God himself is. Look at Psalm 25, verse 6. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. And Mary says, He has remembered his mercy, like he promised. God has remembered his promise to Abraham. In the book of Genesis, Abraham, of course, is the father of many nations. He's the, he's the patriarch of patriarchs. And in, in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God says this, and The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. It's the promised land, of course. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This promise is furthered as chapters later when Abraham is doubting God's promise of offspring, of children. How can I have a great nation? Because he's old and he's childless. We can hear Abraham asking, How long, O oh Lord? How long? How long? I don't have much longer. You get a move on. Then this happens. Genesis 15. And he brought him outside. God brought Abraham outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said, so shall your offspring. This is the promise that Mary is referencing. Mary sees the sun rising on God's promises fulfilled. A new day is dawning. She is glimpsing the end of the story. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Jesus is the fulfillment of this promise. In him, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He has made a great nation, his church, his body, and the children whom Jesus has been given are more numerous than the stars. Andrew Peterson says it this way. I can't just say these words. I have to sing them since it's from a song. Father Abraham, not have dreamed of this, could never understand the end of all those promises. How all the pieces fit, every star and grain of sand is safely hid in Jesus' hand. So where does this leave us this morning? Humility, my friends, is a 
prerequisite to worshiping God. God the Father is seeking those to worship him in spirit and in truth. And the truth is we cannot approach God on our own. We are not strong enough, smart enough, or holy enough. We have failed in countless ways with the trials and temptations that have come our way. <laughs> not a very happy way to end the sermon, is it? You might hear this and think, oh, that's a little depressing way to end on a high note, Josh. We fail, everyone. We fail. We cannot approach God on our own. But we haven't been left alone. No, Jesus has become for us the new and living way who brings us to God. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tried and tested as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters, let us boldly approach the throne that we might receive mercy and grace, that we might receive hesed in our time of need. Let's pray together. Lord, you are making of us a nation a people who call on you. You have given us promises that you will not leave us or forsake us. If we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come.
friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the